Eric, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Why don't we start with, um, with your background, you know, where you started and uh, sort of the arc of your career and, and uh, where you are today. Sure. Uh, so I received my PhD uh, from Yale University in the 1990s, in 1997, and um, actually went to Yale, uh, I think, really interested in understanding American political, political history, but not necessarily thinking I would study Congress. But while I was at Yale, I um, had the chance to work with David Mayhew and other scholars who are sort of the you know, leading experts on the institution and, and became really passionate in, about trying to understand uh, both the role it serves in our politics and also some of its limitations. Uh, and that's, uh, my first job was at UC Berkeley, uh, where I've spent most of my career other than a brief interlude at, at Harvard for three years. So why did you decide on Berkeley, which is about as far away from Washington as you can get? Yeah, um, and, it, and it is a distinctive experience being so far from Washington. You are, you do feel uh, somewhat removed from the kind of day-to-day -day hustle that, you know, colleagues of mine who are based in Washington or New York or Boston really experience. Um, I think one benefit of it is that it does, you know, put you more out even that Berkeley is unusual, but you still are in some sense more out in the country as it experiences politics, you know, where, which is not Congress is the day to day. It's, it's a more distant institution, which is how people experience it what in, in Indiana or Florida or lots of other places. So I, so I do think there's, there's some advantage to being here in California as a kind of vantage point to understanding. Got it. And so in terms of the work or your, your areas of interest, if you, you're doing a lot of different things, I know, and you've been cited by others who've been on this program already. Uh, and there's a lot of you know, particular areas you focused in, but could you give us just a broad overview of what are the general kinds of areas you're working in and what are the overarching kinds of questions or themes of your work? Right. Um, so I would say in terms of overarching themes, I've, much of my work has, has been historical and trying to understand the development of American political institutions with Congress and our political parties kind of at the, at the forefront of those questions. And so trying to understand to what extent did um, have efforts to reform Congress worked or not work? To what extent have we uh, made changes in institutions that make them more democratic or accountable? And to what extent have changes had counterproductive productive kinds of effects. Trying to, and in particular, I would say a lot of my research has been focused on trying to understand the interplay of ordinary voters, citizens, and our political institutions. So I, I found in, in a lot of my work that, that a lot of the most important action happens at that sort of intermediate level, organized groups, um, state and local parties, um, a local press as a kind of intermediary between ordinary voters and their elected officials. And so trying to understand that process and how it's changed over time has, has been kind of at the core of, of much of my research. Well, why don't we, you know, start on your work in terms of the true questions and answers, you know, if we look at your book, um, Disjointed Pluralism, which has been uh, brought up a few times on this program, you know, can you talk about what problem was there and you know that, that that book addresses and what sort of things did you find what answers did you find to that problem in your work right so so that book really emerged in a lot of ways out of the literature on congress of the 1990s which is when i was a graduate graduate student so um a series of really prominent excellent political scientists at, at the time uh were writing books about congressional institutions trying to understand congressional institutions and those books uh, tended to be of the flavor of trying to demonstrate how Congress is really well organized to serve the interests of, let's say, the majority party in Congress, or a shared interest of, in, of all members in, in information so that they can make effective laws. Um, or, you know, going back to my old advisor, David Mayhew's classic book, to serve the individual reelection motivations of members of Congress. And you'd read those books and, and each one of them, you know, was really excellent and, 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 and had 
important insights. And yet there is this kind of contrast between, between that literature and I guess my sort of work, working understanding as a citizen of how Congress operated, which was, you know, from these books, you get the sense of Congress as this well-tuned machine to serve this well-defined interest. And yet when you watch Congress, there seems to be an awful lot of dysfunction, a lot of frustration. And that frustration is not just among the public, the distrust of Congress, but members themselves who felt like, you know, that the institution's not working well. And so how do we understand this, this seeming contradiction between a Congress that's designed by rational self-interested members to serve their goals and this sense of frustration that the institution doesn't seem to work well. And the answer that, that, that I develop in the book or, or try to develop is that the problem is that there is no one single interest that Congress is serving. Instead, you can think about multiple interests, collective interests that members of Congress share with one another. And you can think about particular kinds of institutions that might serve each of these, these interests but the problem is that they're gonna be in tension with one another or contradict one another. So that the institutions that might help maximize say policymaking information are gonna be in tension with the interests that help majority party members win, you know, secure power or that might help individual members get reelected. And so the question I ask in the book is what happens when you have members of Congress over time shaping an institution where those members have these multiple potentially competing interests in mind as they make decisions about that, those institutions. And so, you know, you're, you're basically synthesizing a lot of these different interests into kind of a tapestry view of, you know, what's happening in Congress and how it evolves, or at least to how the rules uh, and the various uh, norms evolve, I guess you could say. Um, you know, and I was particularly struck about some of the work that was around, you know, the late 1800s or early 1900s, you know, in some of that tension between centralization of, of power and decentralization to committees, you know, and Reed and Cannon, you know, can you talk a little bit about what you found when you were doing that work in terms of I guess this interplay between structured decision making through rules and at the, on the other hand, this kind of more concentrated power in, in a figure like the speaker. Right, um, so, so I think there are a couple of things that go, are going on there. I think one thing that, that's really important is that one way in which you can get major reforms, and I think the Reed rules are a really good example of this. this these are rules adopted in 1890, 1891 by a Republican majority that basically establishes the House of Representatives as a majority rule institution. Prior to that, the minority obstructed business as much or more in the House as they did in the Senate. And so one of the things that I argue in the book about Reed is that what he does is act as a kind of entrepreneur linking together Republicans' partisan interest in, in control of the institution with a much broader general member interest in Congress's capacity to actually make laws and, and to secure its power in place in the institution. And that um, he basically acts as an entrepreneur linking together these in interests and eventually uh, forcing the Democrats when they're in the majority to readopt his rules, thereby institutionalizing them by demonstrating that without these rules, we cannot function at all, right? And so, so I think that's a really nice example of how a leader was able to kind of harness these multiple interests in a way that then did give rise to a very much centralized party dominated leadership structure that was in effect for, for about a decade and a half. Um, at the same time, to, to get at your second point, one of the things that happens in that period is that as Reed and then his successor, Joseph Cannon, concentrate power in the leadership, that basically is shutting out other kinds of member interests. And so, and, and, and there are two in particular that, that become really important. One is a, a policy-based cleavage where you have these progressive Republicans who are descending from the um, dominant conservative Republicanism that say Cannon represented and wanna be able to pursue those policy goals and are basically being shut out by the party. And then the second is, is basically ambitious members who want 
don't just want to be kind of automatons there. They want to exert independent influence in our politics. And so they want to create power bases for members to exercise that power. And those two interests essentially come together, again, under the leadership of an entrepreneur, in this case, um, George Norris of Nebraska is one of the key figures, um, to overthrow Cannon and start a process of decentralization where power shifts back to the committee system. And so I think that period is a really nice example of kind of peak of party government where one interest for a while was dominant, but that came at a cost to these other interests that members cared about. And eventually they came together to, to overturn that system. And so do you have a sense from your work about this centralized versus decentralized structure, which one is better or which one is better in certain circumstances or is it just more entrepreneur and timing driven? Well, I mean, I think that, I think there are trade-offs and um, one way to think about it is that a centralized system is gonna be better at setting a very general policy direction and giving Congress a kind of equal standing to bargain with a president, let's say, in shaping that policy direction. So in that sense, you can argue it, that it allows for kind of accountability. On the other hand, a centralized system is not gonna be as good at bringing to bear the kind of decentralized expertise and information that's out there in the country. It's a very diverse country, lots of different interests, lot of di lots of different um, insights that are sort of coming together. And this, and you can think about a decentralized committee system, for example, as allowing space for those ideas to come to the fore and be expressed. And, and a centralized system tends to be less, less effective at that. So in a sense, decentralization gives Congress a lot of control over the specifics, but not as much over the general direction, whereas the centralized is essentially the, the reverse. And in terms of the decentralized version of this, um, you might suspect that there could be some kind of set of rules or procedures that would allow the Congress to do play that more general role if you had the right rules, if you had the right structure of votes, if you had the right uh, way to sequence a set of votes, that maybe you could get that general direction without the concentration of power. I wonder about your opinion on that kind of idea. Yeah. I mean, I do think, you know, I think it's going to be, it's hard to sustain that as a kind of equilibrium, but I actually, one thing I've been thinking about um, in recent months or past year or so is, you know, when would I say that Congress has actually functioned reasonably well at balancing its considerations? And I'd actually say that in a, in a lot of ways, the uh, Congress of the early 1980s, the Reagan years, um, at that start, it's a period where you have party leaders, Tip O'Neill, who has enough kind of power and resources to be able to you know, have some influence over Democrats in the party. So for example, he appoints the Rules Committee, giving him a lot of say over the agenda, which allows that kind of direction. Yet at the same time, party discipline was a lot weaker than it is today. And members themselves still had a lot more independence in pursuit of reelection as as they had for many decades, but I think arguably do not today. And so as a result, um, you had a Congress where, you know, um, when Democrats agreed, they were certainly able to stand up to Reagan, bargain with Reagan as equals, but there also was space for dissident Democrats to join with Republicans on issues where they, you know, where that was where they were at. And then also similarly, the Senate was run by Republicans, but had a big faction of moderates. And so, um, so again, you had the possibility for cross-party coalitions. And, and at that point, in that context, the committee system was still pretty strong, yet the chairs weren't these completely autonomous independent actors as they were in earlier decades. And uh, I think what we've learned is it's, it's been hard to sustain that kind of balance for long. I think we've tilted much more toward a party dominated system now and um, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I think the, you know, the big question really is whether there are going to be these countervailing forces. You know, the I, I would say the one thing I would change, or one of the things I would change about the book, or or where my view has changed over time, is when I was writing, you know, around 2000, um, 
the analogy between the period we were living in, the 1990s, rise of Newt Gingrich, and 1890 to 1910 was one where my working assumption was, well, over time, what's going to happen is factions are going to develop within the majority party. Members are going to get frustrated that these other interests they have, such as being powerful as individual members, aren't being expressed, and there'll be a kind of revolt eventually, right? And, and there were signs of that at the time, but I think what's striking is the extent to which party government's really been consolidated since then. And, and as I think about that, I, I think the, the reason for that is that members now don't see themselves so much as having independent careers beyond their party. You know, that the members, they're um, they com coming into Congress as essentially party activists, party actors, they see their long-term trajectory is not tied to Congress as an institution, but to their, the success of their party and their ideological faction within that party. And, and so, um, you know, I, in this kind of long term, I, I guess I've been surprised or I've learned that this party government kind of equilibrium, which I had thought was inherently unstable and from all of American history made a, made me have good reason to believe that was the case. And, and I think what's happened is basically the structure of members' interests has changed. And, and that's actually the thing I would worry about most about Congress now is that part of the strength was having this pluralism of interests, given we are such a diverse country, having members of Congress who are representing multiple distinct kind of interests is I think a good thing for system stability and having members who are basically, not entirely, but largely coming in the D on their back or the R on their back is what really counts. You know, I think that really kind of narrows the institution in a, in a, in a concerning way. What about in terms of um, congressional reform efforts uh, since the beginning, right? I mean, there's very little in the constitution about how Congress should conduct its business. And so it goes through periods of reform as you've outlined um, can you talk about those? And is it just a matter of layering? You know, is there any hope to go back to or, or scrape off some layers and, and, you know, try a different structure? Or are we continually just building on attempts from the past and, and, and adding additional complexity? You know, well, I mean, certainly one of the arguments I make in the book is that it's easier to make change by adding, by layering new innovations, because Existing rules tend to create their own constituencies. And so it's easier to kind of um, try to accommodate those constituencies and build on it. So for example, with the budget process, you don't take away the appropriations and tax committees, you add budget committees to that process. Um, so it is certainly easier to do that, but there, there have been times where changes are made that do dismantle elements of the institution. So for example, with the committee system, um, you know, you go from having 73 committees to you know, 26, roughly, and many committees are dismantled. And while it's true, some of them reemerge as subcommittees, but you still are paring back the institution. And, and I think one of the secrets to being able to do that is to build into the reform something else that you're essentially compensating, some other benefit that these members that allow the members who are losing something really to, to essentially live with the reform. Got it. And in terms of the reform, reforms that have happened over the past, you know, 150 years, which ones do you feel like were positive for the institution? Which ones do you think the consequences or the side effects were worse than the disease? That's a great question. Um, I, I guess in terms of the positive reforms, I would say probably the most important would be the Legislative Reorganization Act in 1946, because that's coming at a kind of crucial moment. We just had the Great Depression in World War II, uh, tremendous growth in the power of the presidency and the executive branch, uh, a widespread sense that, well, maybe, you know, having a legislature that's quote unquote, a transformational legislature actively shaping laws Maybe that's just, you know, gone and has to go by the wayside for the modern era and defer to the greater expertise and resources of the executive. And instead, you've got this bipartisan, cross ideological movement to reform Congress. And in particular, what that meant was streamlining the committee system, 
and providing it with the expertise and professionalism that would allow it to be an active player in policymaking. And I think that that really stuck with us since then. And it also, you know, it is an important pivot point because it could have been a moment where Congress, you know, simply gets eclipsed and instead members got, you know, in a sense, got their act together and reshaped the committee system, creating professional expertise and making that a kind of norm of how the committee system would operate that, you know, even today still, you know, has an important influence, even as it's been challenged in some ways by partisanship. So that's a positive one. How about a, a few negative ones? Uh, 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 it's a good question. I mean, so I do think um, in terms of negative reforms, I would say um, certainly, you know, in, in the Gingrich revolution, the effort to defund the committees or reduce the funding of the committees, I think was a, you know, has, has really imposed some harm. We're seeing efforts now on the select committee on the modernization of Congress to try to reverse some of that. Um, and with, I think some success at least. Um, I also think in the long term, I do think that the, that the reforms that have empowered the majority party to structure the agenda ever increasingly kind of finely have been counterproductive. I think it's a little hard though here to point to one specific reform, but, but just to give you a kind of example, um, or general one is for the House Rules Committee to be now such a complete tool of the leadership where it's used routinely to write these very fine tune rules that make it really hard for of the minority to raise alternatives that may well have support of a majority on the floor and just you know basically and make it harder for voters to tell what's going on by essentially using the procedure to prevent something from ever coming up for a direct vote, you know, and then and that sort of coupled, you know, I, I think the important thing to note though is that that's coupled with a lot of other stuff that makes it work. So it's not just, you know, it's not having a powerful rules committee. It's also having a very strong norm that majority party members, you know, will not vote against a rule and will not vote to amend a rule. You know, you can amend a rule, a simple majority can always do that. But if there's a strong understanding that if you vote to bring down a rule and, and especially allow it to be amended, you're you know, breaking a first commandment of the party and are gonna be in trouble, like that just cuts against the idea of majority rule in the institution, I think in an important way. And, and also I just think makes it harder for voters to hold politicians accountable. Great, well, you talk a little bit there about these are the majority prerogatives, right? And so why don't we move on to another subject which is the minority uh, defense mechanisms, right? And uh, of yeah. which the filibuster is the biggest example, I think, or the most uh, infamous one. Maybe you can talk about your work related to the filibuster. What questions did you have about the filibuster? What answers have you found? Sure, and, and so the, my work on the filibuster is collaborative with Greg Waro at Columbia. And it really started with um, Greg and I thinking about, talking about, the 19th century Senate, the Senate before there ever was a cloture rule. And so the key thing to note here is that prior to 1917, there was no rule in the Senate that in a clear way allowed a majority or a supermajority to end debate and bring a matter to the floor as long to a final vote as long as a member wanted to get up and talk. Like there was no procedure that said, oh, if two thirds of the Senate agrees or 60 senators or whatever, that ends debate after a certain amount of time. And so the question we started with was, well, how did anything ever get done when one senator could block things forever essentially? Um, and and so, so we started with that question and, and that evolved into a much broader project about uh, why does the filibuster exist today and what is its role today? Um, and uh, one of the key things we found, though, is that that the filibuster in the 19th century, we argue, um, operated in a much more limited way than it does today, despite these rules. So the rules essentially empowered an individual member to, to stop things at will. But um, we argue that, that um, 
that the understanding of senators at the time was that the filibuster really can only be used by a determined minority to kind of test the will of the majority. In other words, the expectation that senators had is if the majority really cares about an issue, they can wait out the minority and eventually the minority is going to have to, will concede uh, and the majority will rule. And so, um, so the filibuster, we are one of the key starting points we, we notice in, in our data collection is that a whole lot of, actually the majority of significant laws in this period passed with only a simple majority in favor without, you know, the coalitions passed, and it was quite common for major controversial bills to pass by one vote or three votes. And you'd ask yourself, well, why didn't the minority stop it? And, and reading the debate and watching these battles unfold, you got what you learned is these tended to be fought as a kind of war of attrition, where the majority would put a bill on the floor. If the minority opposed it enough, it would filibuster and delay. But the shared understanding was that if the majority really cared about the issue, they would just keep the bill on the floor as long as, you know, for weeks on end, and eventually the minority would, would concede. And the club that was laying behind this was that the majority could always change the rules unilaterally if it really wanted to and it imposed majority rule. So that um, while the, the current rules allowed a filibuster, um, if filibustering got excessive, the minority knew that they ran the risk of the majority essentially going nuclear, as happened recently in the Senate, and that that restrained the minority. That along with, we also argued that there were important kind of norms or that the Senate itself was a kind of small informal club back then. And that there were also, there was a kind of widely shared understanding that this is how it's supposed to operate. And, um, and, and, and that restrained obstruction essentially. So it was cultural. There is a culture, I think there's an important cultural normative aspect of it. Though we argue that lurking in the background was always this threat that we can go nuclear if we have to. But, but the basic idea is we all benefit if we can coordinate on this idea of a limited use of obstruction where the minority can use it where it really cares, um, but, but is gonna have to concede if the majority cares as well. Um, it's important to note this, this sounds good and it, and it has a lot of, it has some important benefits to it in terms of information revelation. There also was a very concrete way in which it was really terrible, which is that unfortunately, you know, the minority that tended to care a lot about these issues was Southern white racists trying to uphold first slavery and then Jim Crow. And the majority that tended to be much more lukewarm and not care enough to, to fight it out was a Northern, you know, more pro-civil rights majority. So it was used, you know, in this, um, in this, um, you know, clearly wrong, you know, morally wrong way, and politically damaging one for the country, um, but the instrument itself, um, I think, fit all senators' interests in some sense, in their as they understood them at the time. And so, where do you come out on, since you've done, you know looked at this issue for so long and for in, in such detail, where do you come out with this? Uh, I mean, filibuster being the kind of extreme example of minority rights, you know, and you could have a Congress that was all majoritarian if you wanted, right? It was 51% on everything. Uh, right. or, or every person in Congress could, could be capable of filibustering every single bill. So these are the two extremes that exist and are possible within, the, within the, any Congress. Right, so yeah. And I think one thing that's important to note is that the way the filibuster works now is very different from how it did in the 19th century. And one is that it's become a much more clear cut veto, right? Where 41 senators can stop something period. But also I think maybe more importantly is it no longer serves that information revelation purpose. It's not the case that the minority has to care more about the issue in order to kill it. Uh, and, and basically the reason is that the um, time on the schedule is so scarce. Senators have so little time and, and the advantage in a filibuster fight in terms of who has to be on the floor is so much in favor of the minority that all you really need is the threat to filibuster or the, 
you know, as long as people know that you can have 41 votes to block something, you're able to do so. So I think that has really shifted the kind of burden in an important way. Um, so um, maybe stepping back from that, how would, you know, what would be a better way to structure things? Um, I think to me, you know, um, I am fundamentally a believer in majority rule in institutions, uh, but I think the idea of majority rule has to be taken more seriously than that that means just the majority party rules. And so what you really, in my view, want is, an, is a more open agenda, but an agenda in which the majority ultimately can, can pass its legislation. So in other words, um, the minority should be able to get its alternatives to the floor and voted upon in a straight vote, you know, up or down vote rather, you know, and uh, so much more open amending opportunities in both the Senate and the House, coupled with the idea that eventually the majority should be able to, to pass legislation. I think the idea of imposing some cost on the majority where, um, where the minority is able to slow things down, it makes a lot of sense because that does require some balancing or attention to, you know, how much do we really care about this issue? Maybe it's worth it for us to compromise a little bit if it allows us to save time and get buy-in, right? I think those kinds of maneuvers, which you don't need to do in the House at all, but, um, but you know, is how the Senate used to work. I think that's all would help the functioning of Congress. Um, you know, I'm afraid now though, we basically have these two choices, right? The House of Representatives where the majority party sets the agenda and gives very few rights to the minority. And the Senate, where leaving aside budget reconciliation, essentially, the minority just has a veto. As long as they can hold 41 votes, that's it. Um, and I think, you know, there's probably space for some middle ground between those two. So it sounds like you're against a filibuster that can block, but you are in favor of a filibuster that can delay for a certain period of time. I mean, I certainly, I certainly think that there can be some value in that. Uh, in, in the ability to delay. And, and this actually goes back in some sense to, you know, my old, uh, much of my work is inspired by David Mayhew and some of his work on, on super majoritarianism. Um, and that I do think it helped inspire Greg and myself was really showing that in some of these earlier kind of situations, um, what you see is public opinion forming in a filibuster bill, battle, right? A lot of time voters aren't paying attention to politics most of the time. And a battle over legislation over a course of several weeks actually gives an opportunity for a kind of interchange between the public and their representatives where voters basically form a decision. This is what we want. And, and sometimes it's not what people thought at first. And so having that delay, having that process, I think can be a good thing in, if it encourages that kind of interactive deliberation. Uh, not so much senators convincing each other, but really the public getting a chance to think about and weigh in. Um, I think the problem as it's, as it's done now, though, is that the filibuster is just a veto. And, and so I think that short, short circuits that deliberation rather than encourages it. And I think the earlier filibusters, I mean, they had a physical component, right? You know, there was a cost if you wanted to do a filibuster. And compared to today, what do you think of that concept? Yeah, I mean, I like the concept. I think the hard part is it's very challenging given current rules to, to write a filibuster rule that brings that back. I mean, you hear a lot of talk about, we're gonna bring back the talking filibuster. And I think that's, I think it's really hard to design a way to do that without changing, you know, a lot of other things about the Senate. And, and just to give you one key example, um, you know, for the Senate to do business, they need a quorum to be available, right? Uh, either. Ideally, it should be present on the floor, but really what it means is that one member can say, there's no quorum here. And so I'm giving a long speech. I say, there's no quorum here. And if the majority can't get 50 people into the room, the Senate has to adjourn, right? And the problem with just going back to a talking filibuster is how do you get around the challenge that, yeah, you can say as long as, you know, you have to give a long speech, but what's to stop that person from just saying, oh, there's no quorum here. And then the burden to keep the quorum is always going to be on the majority, or at least, you know, it, it's hard to change that so that, you know, you could have the person giving the speech 
be the only minority member around and the majority needs 49 people to be available to come to the floor. So it's that kind of detail that's hard to get around. So, um, so to me, what I would lean more towards is, is provisions that open up opportunities for the minority in terms of amendments. I think that that, you know, that right now it's just too easy for the majority to shut out minority amendments and, and doing that and, and provisions for kind of building in direct votes on, on those amendments. While that doesn't exactly, it doesn't directly delay, it does force some deliberation, some consideration over time. And, and I guess, you know, my own, if I were designing the institution, I would probably focus more on some sort of deal where it's essentially um, eventual majority rule, but much more open and, and codified amending opportunities. So no more filling of amendment trees. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, you know, I think that uh, you can see why the majority went in that direction, but it's, I think it's been really counterproductive for the institute.